In today's edition of ICIT Fellow Insights, we'll speak with Don McLean, an ICIT Fellow and Chief Cybersecurity Technologist at DLT, on the evolution of the risk management framework and how organizations can leverage it to improve their security posture. Hi, I'm Don McLean, ICIT Fellow and Chief Cybersecurity Technologist for DLT Solutions. Well, the risk management framework, like all of NIST's work, is very thorough. And that's both a blessing and a curse. There's a lot of detail there. And what NIST has done is to create a framework that is so filled with every aspect of security that in many cases, agencies find themselves digging into areas that perhaps are superfluous or not really necessary for them. There's a lot of emphasis on business process, which is fine, but it tends to supersede the need for tangible cybersecurity engineering. There's a lot of documentation requirements, and where there's documentation, there's review of documentation required as well. That's done on a system by system level, and I've been in charge of agencies where we had 220 systems, each of which would have a, no kidding, two or three foot stack of documentation that had to be written, reviewed, uh, edited, and, um, and authorized. It requires a lot of time and effort. And the thoroughness is fine, but unfortunately, it tends to detract from the more tangible measures of security engineering that are really required to keep agencies safe. And what happens is, uh, I used to joke that, oh, now that that document's been signed, the, the bad guys can't break in anymore. Because <laughs> yeah, a lot of times it would be a document review that would take three months, and then the fix that it, that it documented and recommended would take three minutes, <laughs> you know. So it, it's fine in, in, in its intent, but the implementation requires an excess of bureaucracy. So in addition, I found that each agency has its own way of implementing the framework, and so it's not always clear exactly how to, how to get that done. Again, it's a matter of implementation rather than what's inherent in the framework. What I ran into when I was assessing systems for a system integrator was, in effect, a conflict of interest. The very agency that was paying me to assess them was also the agency whose problems I was trying to unearth. And Although the intent of the framework and all and the assessment is to find the problems and fix them and to improve matters, it was often seen as kind of like an IRS audit, find and scold, find and embarrass, find and uh, uh, diminish your stature in the company or in the agency. And that's not really what it's supposed to be, but that in effect is what it, what it is, unfortunately, at a cultural level. So I, in addition, the company that I worked for would often be the same company that was implementing and deploying the software and systems that I was assessing. So not only was I running up against my customer, I was running up against the company that was signing my paycheck. So there was a lot of pressure not to, uh, not to be too embarrassing in stuff that I found. In addition, there is an overemphasis on keeping systems running there were times when I found severe problems in some pretty sensitive systems that we recommended the system be shut down and before too long we were on the phone with some pretty high-level government people telling us that we had better not do that. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, what we would do is we would say well can we at least fix some of the more egregious problems and put the other problems on a fast track to be to be repaired and, and minimize any downtime required to do that and we would negotiate our way out of that. So what I would recommend is to improve this situation. The agency paying the bill or paying the freight should not be the same agency that's under assessment. For instance DHS could be the agency that would be responsible for paying the bills on assessment of other agencies. Unless, of course, you're talking about DHS itself, in which case some other agency. It could also be a, a global agency such as GAO, perhaps GSA, something like that. So that would eliminate that. I, I would also recommend that this, if the company doing an assessment should not be the company that also owns, runs and operates those systems. So that would be item one. There's also Inherent in the whole assessment process, and this is not out an implementation problem, this is built into the assessment process, is the requirement to do three things when evaluating a security controls. 
Those three things are interview, examine, and test. That is, you interview the person responsible for implementation and maintenance of security controls. You examine the documentation associated with that, and then you test to see if it really works. In my view, the interview and examine process processes are not particularly helpful because when you interview somebody, they typically are less than forthright in their answers, let's put it that way. When you examine documentation, well, so what? It doesn't really tell you if the control is actually working. The only thing that really matters is testing that control. Just, you know, for example, let's say there's a security complexity requirement and I interview the system administrator. Oh yeah, we've got a system uh, security com uh, password complexity requirement. Really, it's in place? Oh yeah. Then you look at the documentation, the documentation says, yes, we have this in place. And you spend a lot of time setting up those interviews, conducting those interviews, and looking at that documentation and finding the latest version, et cetera, then you test it and it doesn't really work. Well, you've really wasted your time interviewing him, and all that really matters is, does it actually work? Have they actually done it right? And the other pieces of the puzzle are time consuming, result in a lot of documentation. My system admin integrator company would be paid handsomely by the hour to do that, but it didn't really improve the security of the system in question, and it didn't really get to the root of the problem. You'd spend a lot more time finding and documenting a problem than just fixing it. It's not that hard for, in that instance to just fix the complexity thing and be done and move on. So the third thing I would say is that there's sort of a get out of jail free card when a problem is found or a vulnerability is found in a security system and that's called a POAM, plan of action milestones. And what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to document the weakness and then come up with an estimate of how long it's going to take, its severity, and an estimate of the cost. So what happens is, unfortunately, you're in compliance if you found the, the vulnerability and you've documented the fact that you plan to fix it and that you plan to have the money someday to fix it, but you haven't actually fixed it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so my joke used to be POEM actually stood for procrastination of any matter because it would just allowed you to put the, put, move the goalpost. And even if you came up with a deadline, typically what would happen is you'd reach that deadline and then there would be no money, time, or resources to fix it, so the deadline would be simply be moved back. I saw poems in some cases that had been open, that is, when I say a poem, I mean a vulnerability that's un unaddressed for as long as seven years. Uh, and in that case, I finally ruffled some feathers, went to the top, and said, this thing needs to be fixed. And everyone told me not to do that, but I just said, it needs to be done, let's just fix it. And they said, it's going to break everything, it's going to break everything, and everyone's going to get in trouble, et cetera, et cetera. Well, nothing broke, and no one got in trouble, and in fact, the person that fixed it got an attaboy because uh, he fixed it within 48 hours of me making a fuss about it, even though the poem had been open for seven years, and he knew about it for seven years. <laughs> well, I think the first one I've mentioned, touched on briefly earlier, uh, and that is that an assessment is a punitive exercise. It's not a punitive exercise, or it shouldn't be conducted that way. It's meant to be an assistive exercise. We're not trying to punish you for doing bad things or for deficiencies in your security program. We're trying to unearth problems that absolutely everybody has and assist you in addressing them, prioritizing them and determining what is severe and really needs to be addressed in, in your system. Um, the other element is not so much a misconception per se, but rather that each agency has its own unique way of implementing the RMF. And while there is some latitude built into it, specifically so that different agencies with different requirements and different software and system architectures can implement the RMF their own way, each agency had some very, very different notions of how to actually go about implementing the risk management framework. Some skipped steps, some were excruciatingly detailed in how they did things. Some wanted everything in hard copy and that would take forever and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think a consistent and cl clear approach of how to describe how to implement the RMF would help and w without sacrificing too much flexibility. You don't want to lo lock people into a, a rigid process that doesn't really help. But at the same time, there, there was, even after all this time, still a lot of differing opinions on how exactly to get this done. And in addition, there are perhaps not a misconception, but there's varying levels of enforcement and stringency in how it's done as well. Um, some, some authorizing officials to whom I would hand in a security authorization package would scrupulously read every word and say, hey, how come there's a typo on page 383 here? 
and I would go and fix it, and that was stressful to put it mildly. <laughs> Uh, but then other, other officials would take a stack of documentation that took six months to prepare and was two and a half feet high and say, where do I sign and give it not a second thought and everything in between. So I think that actually perhaps is where the executive order of May 11th may come into play by holding agencies more accountable. It may force people to actually pay more heed to this documentation, which will be good because they will... They'll, they'll make sure that they know what's really going on with their systems. The, the cybersecurity framework is a framework that came out, I believe, in 2014. It's much more recent than the NISC risk management framework. It's much broader in, and higher level in how it approaches security. It's also simpler and much easier to understand. And that makes it suitable for upper management to look at in very global terms, how their security programs are really operating. There is some difference of opinion on whether cybersecurity frameworks should be used for risk management versus assessing the maturity level of a cybersecurity program. I've talked to some of the people that wrote it, and even the people that wrote it have different opinions. <laughs> However, the Trump executive order says use it for risk management, so that's, uh, that's, that's how it'll go forth. What it does, is, it, the way it fits into the risk management framework is, is the risk management framework is much more granular, much more nitty gritty, much more on the ground. The cybersecurity framework allows upper management to look at a broader level at the efficacy of their security programs and to use that for budgeting and for strategic decisions. What kind of, what kind of cybersecurity technology should we really be adopting? What should we be anticipating? What are the trends in how the bad guys are uh, approaching things and are we doing the basic things, the broad level things. Uh, the, you know, the cybersecurity framework breaks things down in a pretty simple uh, structure. There's, uh, I believe it's five verbs, identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover. And you're supposed to do those things to devices, applications, data, networks, and users. Personally, I would have added cloud, but it's not there. Uh, so that's a pretty simple framework, you know, a five by five framework into which you can plug things and say, hey, do we really identify our devices, which quite often agencies don't even know what devices they have. Uh, and so, you know, at, at the high level, they can say, hey, you know, here's a strategy. Let's figure out what the heck we have. Let's figure out what systems we have. Do we really know what our data is and where it goes and where it's supposed to go? I've assessed systems where data started in one location and was extracted to another location and then to another location and then split off into two more locations which fed it back into the original location. <laughs> so identifying your data and where it goes is actually more of a challenge. It's easy to laugh at that, but when you look at the complexity and the history of those systems, uh, you, you understand why it's di more difficult than it sounds on the surface to really uh, get, get a handle on that. So the cybersecurity framework in short, uh, simple terms, is a high level picture of your security program and allows you to make better use of the risk management framework. Well, there's a number of things that brings to, to our company and also to our customers who are almost exclusively government customers. First off, the, the research that ICIT does is very, very valuable. It's both anticipatory in that it looks ahead at what things, what's happening in the industry and what's happening on the bad guy side. You guys spend a lot of time crawling around in the nether regions of the internet to find out what the, really, what the bad guys are really thinking, what they're really up to, both in terms of their motivation and in terms of their capabilities. That's very, very helpful, and it's not something that I particularly feel comfortable doing myself, but it's, but it's very helpful. It's also, ex the research is also extremely valuable in response to big events, for instance, the Equifast breach. That's not directly applicable, perhaps, to government customers, but knowing what happened and having that research at our disposal is very, very helpful in enabling us to talk to the major issues if it comes up in conversations with customers. So the research, both reacting to major events and anticipating what's going to happen, is an incredibly valuable piece of the ICIT uh, uh, organization. <clears throat> you guys also track legislation uh, res uh, regarding IT in general and cybersecurity in particular. For instance, the Manage, uh, Modernizing Government uh, Act and uh, some other uh, major pieces of legislation that require some input from industry, uh, both in terms of its, uh, its content and also 
pushing that legislation forward, saying this is a good idea, and, and it's, you, you're very, very good about being bipartisan. I mean, the legislation you push is not ideologically motivated, it's motivated to protect the nation. <clears throat> and um, you also, of course, put on a lot of events, uh, um, which helps send the security message out. Uh, that communication among industry leaders is incredibly helpful. It's always good to know what our customers are thinking, not just for business, but also so that we can work really to help protect the nation. Yeah. I mean, I've reached an age where if I wanted to retire, I could. So I'm really not in this game to make money anymore. Don't tell my company. I'm in it to really to help protect the nation from bad guys.